Okay, we'll call to order the September 15th, 2020 meeting of the Sheboygan County Board. Are we certified in compliance with the open meeting law? We are. The agenda was posted on September 11th at 3 p.m. Next item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item of business is a roll call. There are 25 supervisors present. Very good. Next item of business is the approval of the August 18, 2020 journal. Supervisor Abler. I'll make a motion that we approve the okay. uh, August 18th journal, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Abler. Supervisor Hoffman. I second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Under discussion? Seeing no discussion, we will take a vote. Supervisor Smith? That motion is approved unanimously. Next is presentations. Uh, we have Deidre Martinez from the Chamber of Commerce, Executive Director, and Star Grossman, Public Health Officer, giving update on COVID. everybody thank you so much for allowing me to speak for a little while this this afternoon or this evening I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time kind of going through what our current picture looks like related to COVID in our community unpack our benchmark criteria a little bit for the community and for the people that are here and then talk about the great partnerships that we've been able to develop through this process um, this graphic hopefully looks familiar to you we do release this every um, Monday through Friday from our office, and we also have a daily update that goes out via email if that's something that people are interested in getting. So if you're not familiar with it, please follow us so that you can see and be more up to date about what we're seeing locally. Um, this is actually yesterday's numbers, uh, but we do have just over 1,200 cases locally that have been confirmed. Uh, 54 cases came over the weekend, and into Monday, actually, we had 30 cases yesterday. This is a fairly busy day for our office. We have 124 people who are actively ill at this time and uh, 10 deaths. And actually today we did add two more deaths to our death count. So our total of, is for at 12 there. Um, and then related to hospitalizations, we have seen an uptick in hospitalizations lately. I don't know uh, for those who have been following closely, um, we were averaging two to three people in the hospital at a time for, for quite a while. And um, our current hospitalization is at nine. Uh, earlier this week, it was at 13, which was kind of the highest that we've seen it thus far. And we have been hearing from our hospital systems that they're seeing an uptick in re people re presenting with respiratory illness. So what does that all mean? And why do we do this benchmark criteria and kind of share these metrics? So. 
as people are um, likely aware in this room, um, shortly after the, the Safer at Home order was overturned, we were faced as a local community with trying to find a way to help people make decisions about what they're going to do day to day and keep the community safe. So as a result of that, uh, we used a lot of different models and pulled together a lot of different metrics for how we could um, give recommendation to the community. And we settled on these uh, benchmark criteria, which we release and update every week on Friday. So this is last Friday's uh, benchmark criteria update. Um, as you can see, our cases and activity level continue to be red. Cases is a state level met metric, so that's looking at the state as a whole. Are we, are, is the percent positive cases, is it trending up? And that's um, consistently been red for quite some time. And then activity level is specific to Sheboygan County. It's looking at our burden and our trajectory. So what is our case burden locally? And then where, where is our trajectory or where are we going? Are, are we trending up with cases, are trending down or staying the same? Uh, this last week, our trajectory, uh, did not, we did not trend up, but we do still continue to have a high burden, and we don't, we're not seeing a decline in our trajectory. Related to testing, over the last couple of weeks, our testing capacity locally has decreased. We um, are seeing some of our larger systems not able to test or able to test very um, small populations. So, um, uh, we had at one time we had Aurora was able to do community testing. They've had to take a step back from that and are able only to test um, very specific people who meet specific criteria at this point. Um, we do have some community testing, but it's just limited in scope. So that's why that is a proceed with caution because that testing is not as robust as we'd like to see it locally. And we've been uh, trying to work with our partners to increase that testing capacity. Related to care, even though our hospital systems have seen more cases recently, they are continuing to, per, to uh, let us know that they are able to manage the cases that they're seeing. Um, so that continues to be green. Um, but we do um, connect with them daily to see where they're at with their case counts and how they're doing um, related to ICU beds and those types of things. <clears throat> PPE continues to be yellow. And we work really closely with emergency management to try and make sure that all of our health systems have the PPE that they need to safely care for, for, for people who are ill. And then related to tracing, that metric is specific to public health. That is our ability to follow up with confirmed positive cases or contacts to confirmed positive cases within a 24-hour or 48-hour period. And um, a green color there means that we're able to do that 90% of the time within that 24-hour time span. So, um, if you had been following along a couple weeks ago, that was in the red. Um, we were able to onboard a, a bunch of limited term employees who are helping us with our contact tracing and they're doing a phenomenal job. And so we're really glad to see that metric in the green that allows us to follow up more quickly in the community. I get these questions a lot, like why did we choose these benchmark criteria? So I thought I would just um, kind of lay out why we use this to kind of guide decision making locally. Uh, related to cases, certainly if we see more cases locally, that's going to um, increase the chance that someone's going to come across someone else with COVID within the community. Uh, certainly it has an impact on local businesses and schools and families because as the cases rise, the chance of, of uh, being exposed also increases in the community. Related to testing, if we don't have testing available, it becomes harder to identify outbreaks and keep people safe and keep people who are sick home, especially since... Um, this can present with very mild illness or no symptoms in some people. Um, related to care, I also get this question quite frequently. What, what, is, what is our local picture related to care in our hospitals? So we do have 12 ICU beds locally within our health systems, and we have 22 COVID-dedicated medical surgical beds. So those are um, beds that they've set aside specifically for COVID patients. And um, they try and quarantine COVID patients in one part of the hospital in order to prevent um, spread within the hospital system. So they try and keep staffing around those patients um, limited. So that's what we have locally. That's our local capacity. Our hospital systems indicate that if 50% of our ICU beds or 50% of our COVID dedica dedicated medical surgical beds were full, that that would be a cause for concern for them related to their ability to continue to provide service at the level that they're doing right now. So as I mentioned, we do connect with our hospital systems daily to try and figure out where they're at with that. 
For PPE, um, Steve does a fantastic job. Steve and Bernie do a fantastic job of managing our, our stockpile for PPE. And um, they help connect our health systems with the PPE that they need when there's need of it. Um, that includes our long-term care facilities when there's an outbreak. And then related to contacts, uh, we do follow up, like I said, within 24 hours, or we attempt follow up within 24 hours for positive cases. Delays in that follow up means a delay in our ability to keep people that should be home, home. Um, and so there's, there's an increased risk that that person may continue to be out in the community, continue to be at work or school, um, and then um, can spread the infection to other people. So um, all of those pieces kind of as a collective picture help give us a better understanding of where we're at locally. So this is probably my favorite slide of all the things I'm going to talk about today, and that's our local public health partnerships. We cer certainly could not do all the work that we've done over the last six months alone. Uh, we've been really, really lucky in Sheboygan County to work with such a collaborative community, and um, I am so appreciative of all the amazing people that we have in this community that have pulled together and are doing the best that they can to keep others safe. Uh, we do meet regularly. We meet weekly with all of our long-term care and assisted living partners and provide guidance and resources to them, and we partner with them. We meet um, weekly with our school systems and have been working with them very closely as school has started. I'm, um, we've already seen um, a half dozen or more uh, cases within schools since school has started, so uh, certainly have been really working with them closely to keep students safe and in school as much as possible. Uh, we work, like I said, uh, weekly with our healthcare providers and local businesses. We do um, a chamber call uh, weekly with our local businesses to provide guidance on how they can um, best prevent the spread within their business and also keep their employees and, and their customers safe. So we do a lot of work with our, with our community at large to try and make sure that everyone has the tools that they need in order to keep each other safe. So. Um, I think that out of all the work that we do, some of that collaboration has been the most effective in helping um, curb the spread of infection within our community. So I have to put my community health, public health hat on before I close. I have to always say, like, what can you do to, to prevent the spread of COVID-19? Uh, so I'm going to just um, use my public health hat a little bit here and go through some of the things, and you probably already heard them. So please uh, excuse me if you've heard this all before. But um, certainly, if as a community, if we all work together to support practices that prevent spread, such as masking, physical distancing, and hand washing, um, and staying home when we're sick, those are some of the key things that we can do to keep others safe, keep our family safe, and our community functioning healthily. Partnering uh, with our public health uh, partners when we are doing contact tracing efforts. Uh, we have to reach out to every person who has a positive test and we reach out to all their contacts. So certainly um, the more collaboration that we can have with community members who are experiencing a positive test so that we can make sure that we can keep them home and um, give them guidance about how to, to best care for their family. Um, so partnering on that. Staying aware of our local picture. So if you haven't already signed up for our newsletter, or our daily updates, please do so. And sharing those credible resources. We have a lot of good resources on our county webpage uh, related to COVID. And then certainly leading by example and promoting community wellness to protect vulnerable members of our community. I think everyone in this room is a leader um, and we all have a responsibility to um, lead by example as much as we can to protect others. So. I so much appreciate the opportunity to talk today, and I'm going to actually transition over to Deidre, who's going to speak a little bit about our partnership. Hello there. I am Deidre Martinez, the Executive Director with the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you, Star, and really thank you to our Division of Public Health for the continued partnership and collaboration. We certainly would not be in the good space in comparison to other communities that we are today without, uh, without that partnership. So um, as we fell into this pandemic mode back in March, um, it, like most people, the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce didn't know how to navigate the, uh, the pandemic, how we could better support our businesses. Um, and what we really had to do was take a step back and, and better understand what our businesses were experiencing. 
um, the hardships that they were experiencing, the fears they were experiencing, the, um, the, to help them better under, get a better space uh, available for communication and information that is true and honest and transparent and verified. So we began reaching out to both our members and non-members alike. We felt that it was appropriate at that time to not limit it to chamber members, but also to include all businesses throughout the county as we needed all of them to be successful at the end of the day. So we began a series of surveys. And uh, one of the things um, that I thought was uh, very interesting when we look at April 2020, so this is just a couple weeks after the shutdown, this survey was conducted. And at that time, the number one concern that keeps our businesses, business owners, employees, employers up at night is uh, the health and well-being of their staff. Now we fast forward that to August 2020, and surprisingly, even though uh, we've learned a lot about uh, the virus, we've learned a lot about how to navigate it, certainly better than we knew back in March or April, and continue, um, even in August, to have the, the same number one concern. So our businesses, our employers, their employees continue to be concerned about the health and well-being of their communities. And how does that affect us? So. I'm not here to debate, I am not a medical professional, I am not a public health person. But what it does tell me is that regardless of being open, being shut down, moving forward, not moving forward, that our communities do not have the confidence that they need to get out and patronize our businesses. And it's important because regardless if your business is open, if people are not walking into your storefront or your restaurant and they're not buying your product, you are not making ends meet and you are not where you need to be. So I think it's very important that we take that into consideration as we're continuing to navigate this. With that information, uh, that's kind of where the partnership and collaboration with public health began. We wanted to find some ways to begin to build that confidence with our businesses, um, to give them an opportunity to have real-time conversations, to ask questions, to get answers in real time, um, to ease the unknowns, so on and so forth. So we started a weekly conversation that was again open to members and non-members alike. We averaged, and at the initial onset, um, our numbers were significantly higher, probably more 60 to 70 per week. Now they're at about 40 to 50 live participants each session, and we've moved it to every other week. Um, but what we have also found is that recording, so we record this, we offer this, uh, make this available also to um, anybody on our social media, um, as well as our website, and our, our recordings average 2,000 plus views via social media and website after each session. So again, people are interested in this information. They want to know what's going on. They want a trusted source to turn to. I thought some other things that would be interesting to share as it relates to the business community. Um, staffing changes in April of 2020. From a couple weeks after the initial shutdown, we saw um, almost 44% stayed the same and 6.5% of businesses saw an increase in workforce or demand. So when we look at other communities um, where the whole world shut down and people lost their jobs and they were in dire straits, I'm so pleased to report that that is not what we experienced necessarily in Sheboygan. We move that to August 2020. All businesses have been open for months. And again, almost 42% have stayed the same um, as it relates to their staffing. And over 19% of our businesses in the county have seen an increase in workforce demands. So again, our, our people, it's not perfect. We're certainly not at 100%, but we are in a really good space in comparison to other parts of the nation and the world. We also looked at sales um, in April of 2020, and clearly in April 2020, everything was shut down and it was really hard to, uh, to do much of anything, right? Sales decreased significantly for obvious reasons. Almost 70% of our businesses reported a decrease in sales at that time. I'm happy to report that as we've moved into August, um, we're seeing the rise in numbers and that number is now down to about 50% or 57% decrease in sales. So we certainly have a lot of work to do. Uh, we are not anywhere where we need to be. A lot of our businesses are doing well, um, but they need our continued support. 
And it is vitally important that we keep our communities healthy, that we also build consumer confidence. Again, if they don't feel comfortable leaving their home and patronizing a business, they're not going to buy your products or services. And that's what we need right now. We need our communities confident. We need our communities safe. We need our communities healthy. And we need our businesses to be successful. In addition to being a connector with public health, uh, the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce has continued to offer a variety of additional resources to, again, both members and non-members, um, navigating the CARES Act, virtual conversations with financial institutions. You know, when the world fell apart, there was a lot of talk, there was a lot of stuff going on. And we certainly can't expect everybody to understand all of that. So we really worked hard with um, some of our partners, um, experts in these areas to help relay the messaging in a way that would make sense and be understood by our business community. <clears throat> Understanding unemployment resources for both employers and employees, as we saw employees losing their jobs or employers making really tough decisions, we wanted to make sure that resources were available and people had an opportunity to, again, have those conversations and ask questions in real time. Virtual conversations with Dr. Rye of Purveya Health, a trusted health care provider. Business resources showcasing changes in business practices, curbside pickup, delivery options, online shopping. So what we really wanted to do was encourage and support our business community as they were transitioning their practices. Virtual activities to participate in at home, um, to participate in at home during shutdown, continue to showcase local business and keep people healthy. And we had a significant push for chamber cash, local currency, ensuring that more than a quarter of a million dollars stayed in our local economy during this time and wasn't spent on Amazon or Kohl's.com or any other online shopping giant. Um, providing virtual conversations with local school districts, CPAs, technology experts to help better equip our communities for success, and then opening our resources again to non-members to give an opportunity for all of Sheboygan County businesses to be successful. And that's all I have. So thank you. Um, I, I can't tell you I have friends and family in other parts of the country where their situation certainly doesn't look as positive as ours does. And I recognize ours does not look perfect. But we are in a really good space. And I am proud to be a part of Sheboygan, Sheboygan County. And the continued collaboration and partnerships is what's going to help us move this forward and, and get us to where we need to be. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next item of business is public addresses. All right, the first is James Goldbeck. My name is James Goldbeck, uh, 2420 South 18th Street, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, but in a couple weeks I'm moving, so I'll be calling up one of you here. Uh, the reason why I'm here today is we all know what's going on with COVID. All the previous speakers all said the exact same thing. The reality is everybody's spreading fear. This ordinance should not be here today. This ordinance shouldn't have got, not got this far today. I'm expecting each one of you to do your job and defend the Constitution. You are giving away our rights by even thinking about passing this in the first place. And each one of you are educated enough to know what rights this takes from us. And us outside, we're sick of it and we're growing. We built the website, we are Sheboygan for a reason. And today's the beginning, it is not the end. And so I want each one of you to know that come this April, it is recall time. And it's not for you to do what we say, it's for you to do what is right. And that's what we're asking each one of you. And I know some of you, are amazing at what you do and you do the right thing without anybody even looking. You're the person that does the right thing when no one's watching. But what we see are people doing the wrong thing when everybody's watching and they're disguising it. This was masked and this was brought in. Each one of us outside respect each and every one of you. And yeah, I've heard some of you before in previous meetings. Well, now people want to come. Now they want to show up when this goes on. Yes, correct. We will show up when you're not doing your job. When you're doing your job, we won't show up. That's a good thing. You shouldn't see anybody in here because we should trust you. You have our trust. Now you don't have our trust anymore. So we're gonna be much more diligent when we go to the voting polls 
and we see that about Ordinance 3, and we see everything else that you've done. Ordinance 3, file it today, yes. If somebody pulls a snake move, then to pass it is it a no. And I stand for everybody outside when I say that. That is very important. Each one of you are going to be looked at from a magnifying glass what happens from this moment forward. We understand everybody makes mistakes. Things happen. We are here today. We also understand that we are here today because someone else presented it who is not an elected official. Somebody else who is a CEO of this corporation, and it's time for a change. You seen the red sign outside? April 1997. Voted the number one place to raise a family. Leadership comes in and is no longer that way anymore. And it's a sad day for us. It's all been around here. The extended orders, you don't think we know about the contracts that are issued, that don't have to talk to the board, okay? You are in control of this man. You'll be held accountable. Particularly, some of you up there. Outside, we've had enough. Stop spreading the fear. 99.98% survival rate. The Sheboygan County website, Mr. CEO, please take care of this and have them adjust their numbers on their website. It says 90% recovered. That is false. That is a lie that is spreading fear. It is 99.98% recovered. You're counting active cases that are not yet dead, hospitals or anything, and you're automatically putting them in there. That's not how you do data. You need someone to take care of your analytics for you. That's not how this works. It is not 90%. That's how you spread fear. You want to know how you don't spread fear? Consumer confidence. Let's tell people that it's not 90%. It's 99.98% survival. That's what it is. Look at the numbers. If you ignore the data, you're ignoring your intelligence. God gave you a brain for a reason. Do it. Look into the research. Hello, I'm Patrick Johnson, 644 School Street, Fuller. It is much more important to kill bad bills than it is to pass good ones. When it comes to Ordinance 3, former President Calvin Coolidge is correct. With respect to him, and to add to his quote, it is also important to update laws on the books that are outdated or bad as well, including some of our state of emergencies that gives Mr. CEO ability to do whatever he wants in the name of an emergency and seize private property. Although it, is, uh, although it is predicated by many to go through discussion tonight, I'd like to commend the Executive Committee for unanim unanimously voting to file Ordinance 3. I'm very well aware of the seriousness of COVID and its impacts on certain pre-existing conditions that people may have such as diabetes, heart, kidney, and lung disease, and individuals over the age of 65. To say that I don't take this seriously is very reckless and irresponsible. I have family that works in the medical field. My wife's a nurse. My mom's a nurse. My grandmother's in a nursing home back in Northwest Pennsylvania where COVID is much worse. And extended family members our first responders and doctors. The question of the day is, why are people so angry and vocal about Ordinance 3? It's a combination of multiple things, but at the end of the day, it's pretty simple. One, the initial Ordinance 3 was introduced on a Friday at 8 a.m. Let that sink in for a moment. Would you, do a, would you normally do a business deal like this on a Friday at 8 a.m. when no one's looking? I don't think so. <coughs> Why was a special meeting needed when Health and Human Services, the Health and Human Services Committee meets twice a month? Two, giving public health officials authority to shut down businesses and revoke any relevant county licenses for not following a public health order, or there might be a little COVID in the corner. What if a business invested in innovative technologies 
using the free market, such as UV HVAC systems, UV towers that kill 99.99% of pathogens. And they don't play ball for the mask order that could potentially come down from the public health officer. Are you going to shut them down? They're going above and beyond. They're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep their patrons safe. How can we trust that this power will not be abused, even with oversight from the county board, especially since some of the motions and ordinances and state of emergencies have all been pulled straight from committee to the floor, voted on that same day? There's not a lot of trust there if you haven't figured that out yet. Hasn't the business community been hurt enough over the last five months? Let me remind you, before you vote to either for or against Ordinance 3, about the yoga instructor who, in Sheboygan Falls, who had less than $3 in her business bank account. That is why the business community is furious. Third, show of hands, how many of you read the Wisconsin County Association guidelines and implementing regulations surrounding communicable diseases that is continually referenced. Show of hands. Is that concerning? I think that's very concerning. Within this document, it scopes out how to write local health ordinances, suggest methods of enforcement, and template court-issued orders. In addition, it talks about some pretty draconian methods of enforcement. Interestingly enough, there's a current case in the U.S. federal court system regarding COVID restrictions. Within the last 36 hours, Judge William Stickman in Pennsylvania struck down Governor Wolf's administration's pandemic policies as being overreaching, arbitrary, and violating citizens' constitutional rights. But even in an emergency, the authority of a government is not fettered. This sounds very similar to Ordinance 3 good intentions to address public health, but regardless of circumstances, civil liberties and constitutional rights rule the day. In closing, I spoke to the county board in June about how Sheboygan County residents will be very closely watching actions taken by the board. It seems the warning about transparency and increased communications were not heeded. Are you listening now? Vote no on Ordinance 3, file it, Put it in a manila folder, soak it in lighter fluid, and burn that baby. Thank you for your time. All right, next up, Michael Jones. My name is Michael Jones. My address is W4720 County Road F, Waldo. Ordinance 3 is a draconian control measure against the working class contributing citizens in this great county. It has deeply entrenched roots that stretch far beyond the surface portrayal of simply wearing a mask and if it'll pass, it'll crush the very foundation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness following the golden rule. As of March 13th, 2020, there were 2.1 million Americans living in long-term care facilities here in the United States. This represents 0.6% of the population. As of June 1st, by the CDC's own statistics, 53.3% of all COVID-related deaths came from that 0.6% of the population. Then, magically, the percentage in that population started to rise, and the CDC stopped recording it separately, and they bunched them in with all the other deaths to make one scary, even more doomy and gloomy and fearful number. This leaves a very, very small percentage of the general population that has passed from COVID. In fact, it is considerably less than the average flu season amongst otherwise healthy citizens in the United States. Here in Sheboygan County, we have 10, I guess it's 12 now, unfortunately, every death is sad, 10 COVID deaths. Many have had underlying conditions as well, both here and throughout the country, but I will not focus on that. Being six months into a manufactured crisis, I rest assured saying that 12 is a very low number of deaths in this county. 
Again, unfortunately, the average flu season takes many more lives and is much more dangerous to the general population. So what then made it necessary in March to appoint a county health officer? Ironically, shortly after Evers mask mandate was shut down by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, this is exactly what you, the board, did. Eerie timeline, I would add, because everyone's wondering just what are Starlene Grossman's prior life's experiences and qualifications to act as a key decision maker for all of Sheboygan County's population? Seems like an... I believe you were given the public addresses to the board. No personal attacks should be made on any individual. I'm asking questions about her. I'm not attacking her. I'm taking that as an attack. <laughs> okay. That's a question. Okay, let me continue on then if that's okay with you. Seems like a very important position she holds. Who is she accountable to and for what? Did she take an oath to the Constitution during her appointment? What is her salary? These are just a few questions I feel we the people deserve to know the answers to. Seems she will be given unchecked power during a government deemed health crisis. So who are we really dealing with here? Let's have some transparency between the board and the constituents of this county. Using your own numbers from Ordinance 3, let's do some extremely simple math, grade school level, I might add. There's 34 hospital beds, as you showed earlier, de devoted to COVID in this county between HSHS Memorial. If 50%, so 17 of those beds are being used for COVID, we supposedly have a health crisis in this county. I don't want to get sidetracked, but six months into this pandemic, and we have not more than 34 beds in this county? Seems to me that if people in charge really cared about other members of this community, some positive enhancements to our medical preparations and abilities maybe have made in the last six months. But then again, if you thought ahead and you acted for once instead of waiting for something to happen, I suppose that would limit your ability to cast more doom and gloom and fear and take away and control and take away from us and enhance your need to control us. So back to the number, 17 COVID cases out of 115,000 456 residents in Sheboygan County, which is what I could find from the 2018 census. So that deems a health crisis, 17 patients. That is 0.000147% of the population in this great county. Seems like a horrific dream to give anyone unilateral control over the population over such a minute number. These are numbers that expose all of your thirst for control and power. This tiny fraction being used to stifle our county is absurd and frankly creepy. Perhaps now you see why all of the freedom-loving working class men and women gathered outside tonight in bright colors, enthusiasm, and support for America are here to say no to Ordinance 3, no to more big government intrusions, and no to any of you that decide to vote in favor of it. We are not here to be used as your mindless pawn and further divide our community, friends, families, and customers alike over a mask mandate that may not even work depending on who you talk to. Enough is enough and remember this fact. We wake up every day and find some way to produce a good or service someone else is willing to pay for to fund your careers and salaries. Without the working class, you have nothing either. Your system goes broke. Whether it's a 22-year career or a recent six-month appointment, you work for us, not the other way around. So let's do this differently going forward. Instead of trying to pass a permanent ordinance in a blitzkrieg fashion to combat a temporary situation, discuss it with us first. Make the time to be transparent. Surely you cannot be so short-sighted as to realize affecting every one of our businesses won't in turn jeopardize yours as well. In the end, I can't do one more quick paragraph. Thank you for your time. God bless America. The best is yet to come. All right, Frederick Phelps. State your name and address, please. In five minutes. Good evening. My name is Frederick Phelps of 69 North Milwaukee Street in Plymouth. I've been glad to see the diverse backgrounds and views of the community that's come out to speak against this measure. I do not share all the same views of some of those who have come before me. I'm sure I won't share those uh, of all who come after me. However, on one issue, we are united. This ordinance was a bad idea. To me, this is not an issue of the present virus. This ordinance does not restrict itself to that topic, so neither shall I. No, this is a question of liberty. 
We are here to determine if you seek to represent us or to rule us. We are here to determine if you see yourselves fit to direct us against our express will. Mr. Payne has publicly and repeatedly defended this measure, explaining that uh, it restricts state law. He assured me directly that this was important because uh, some of these state statutes written in a bygone era were downright frightening in the extent to which they granted emergency powers. On this latter point, he's entirely correct. I encourage everyone to read some of these state statutes. We have work ahead of us in Madison. That does not concern this council, however. You cannot directly overturn state statutes. No, you can only pass your own. Therefore, the question before us is only, what did this ordinance contain? There are only three possible variants. Either it enabled uh, an increase of power for the government, it did nothing whatsoever, or reigned in the government and provided extra over oversight. If it grants greater power, that you both deceive and defy us, you, uh, we must ask, do you find these downright frightening state statutes do not go far enough? If you pass an ordinance that changes nothing, then you demonstrate impotence and act, add to a sea of paperwork to no avail. No, this would be foolish indeed. You all hold office for a reason, so this cannot be the case. Restricting state overreach would demonstrate your capacity for responsive governance. It would affirm that Americans are ruled by their consent alone. You would leave room for timely and moderate response in the face of future crisis. By doing so, at the same time, you could also keep frightening overreach from a bygone era at bay. Clearly, this is the best option. Now, you may not all understand where we're coming from. You may view this as an overreaction or not take seriously some of the concerns expressed. You may not understand why we insist so adamantly that such serious actions only be taken by elected officials alone. However, I contend that questions of liberty are never small matters. This ordinance seems destined to fail. Good. However, we will not let our attention slacken. We remember our history. A decade before the revolution, the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act. This allowed the Crown's taxmen to bypass local representatives and take money directly from the people. Through peaceful demonstration, we Americans got the act repealed. We celebrated too soon. The very same day that the British Parliament pa repealed the Stamp Act, they passed the, Declar the Declaratory Act, which affirmed Parliament's right to bind the colonies in all matters whatsoever. A decade later, the damage was truly seen. A chink in liberty's armor is a serious issue, no matter how small it starts off as. Prove to us that you understand our relationship. Do nothing or stand with us, but do not act against the people. Act responsibly, repair our trust. We are still watching. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Jackson. when you get old. Um, okay, good evening. My name is Agnes Jackson, 3416 South 10th Street, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, Ordinance 3 is vague and dangerous. Why? Any, A-N-Y, defined as without restriction, limitation, unmeasured, unlimited, to any extent, any degree. Any is used many times in this Ordinance 3. Why begin by defining a tiny little three-letter word? because it gives un unlimited power over you and your family's lives, because you too are the public, whether you are on the board or off. Line 22 and 23 says, you the county board found it in the best interest of the public to create a civil enforcement mechanism, yes, civil enforcement, for violations of public health orders. I ask you, do you, do you find it in the best interest 
of your families, all orders and their enforcement will apply to you and to them. That is a lot of unlimited power to be given to one health officer and the designees and assistants. Let's look at what you are authorizing via Ordinance 3. Line 42 states, upon appearance, that's vague, of any communicable disease, that's undefined. The public health officer will report to you, the board. However, lines 47 to 50 indicate that the PHO has already taken all measures necessary as needed, that is unlimited power, before reporting to you, the board. Yet in line 51, there is a loophole which says, or as the Wisconsin Health Secretary may direct. So you may be left out of the information loophole. That's vague. Line 54 authorizes a single health officer to do whatever is reasonable and necessary. That's vague, it's unlimited, <laughs> and it's dangerous. I'm going to take you to line 68. A person who is suspected of being infected, suspected, that ought to scare the bejesus out of you. Let's get back to line 60. No one can interfere. Dangerous. With the investigation of a place, your home, or the occupants, your family, by the PHO and assistants. I'm seeing two problems here. One, who are these assistants? What law enforcement and investigative training have they had and for how long? Who monitors their unlimited powers? Dads and grandpas on the board. If your kids or grandkids are suspected and come under investigation, can you help them? Nope. Ladies, can you help your siblings or their kids if under investigation? No. Gentlemen, can you help your spouses or your parents? No. You board members, who will help you if you're under investigation? No one. County board members, do you really want to authorize a PHO and assistance to investigate your family on suspicion when your natural instinct and compulsion is to help them is labeled interference and therefore illegal? This ordinance three is very, excuse me, very dangerous. Line 76 limits an order to 60 days, but line 77 nullifies that 60 day limit when it adds an order may be extended by subsequent orders, that's multiple, unending duration. To answer concerns, Mr. Payne uses soft, fluffy, vague words like, well, we hope not, or that's not our intention, but hopes and intentions are not in Ordinance 3. What recourse supervisors would you have, would you as a part of the public have, should you or your family come under investigation? Line 116 tells us, Quote, proceeding under any other ordinance or law relating to the same or any other matter shall not preclude enforcement under this section. Why is that even in the ordinance? Who needs such ironclad authority? Tonight, your vote will determine the fate of Ordinance 3 and its revisions. If you fail to file Ordinance 3, you and your family must comply without recourse. Beside, because like you, or because you like we are the public. So we thank you for voting to file Ordinance 3 and its revisions, and we call on you to stay vi excuse me, vigilant that no future proposals like this are ever authorized. And I thank you. Thank you. All right, Amelia Lopez. Thank you everyone for allowing us to speak on this. My name is Emilio Lopez, 2939 Enterprise Drive, Sheboygan. First and foremost, any proposed ordinance wishing to give government say over what is best for me and my body is clear overreach. Administrator Payne has stated that this ordinance is not meant to do so. However, the proposed ordinance states the public health office will take any measures necessary to prevent, suppress, and control communicable diseases and the measures used against them as needed. It's very concerning to me. What measures are we talking about? 
The, one, the only ones proposed by our health officials right now are wear a cloth mask that is made similarly to the underwear that I'm wearing right now, social distancing, and vaccines, which if you studied health and nutrition at all, you know that all of them are terrible for our health. Our bodies need oxygen. Our bodies need community. We don't need neurotoxins, aborted fetal DNA, et cetera, injected into our bodies to be healthy. This proposed ordinance uses terms such as reasonable, necessary, measures, et cetera. Why? They want this to be as vague as possible and ultimately give themselves the power to decide what those terms mean. I think that's been abundantly clear by all the speakers here that we are aware of this. That's not going to work. Ordinance 3 also states, no person who is knowingly infected may willfully violate the recommendations of the local health officer and goes on to say that no person may take, aid in taking, or cause to be taken a person who is infected or is suspected of being infected to any public place or conveyance. I don't know about you guys, but it sounds like a lot of contract tra tracing to me as well as invasion of privacy. Again, very concerning. Giving one person the authority to make decisions for an entire county for any length of time is ridiculous, let alone 60 days. Does that individual forfeit their salary during this time? Likely not. But the people of this county will be gravely affected while this person sits in their office continuing on as normal, making decisions for them. You stated in the beginning of this proposed ordinance that you recognize it is critical that the economy and businesses remain operational. Yet you propose giving one person the authority to revoke their licenses? How can we not all see the hypocrisy in that? You know, I, I only had an hour, about an hour to prepare for this. Um, and I showed up during, um, I'm sorry, ma'am, I forgot your name, but you were the first speaker. And it's very concerning to me, again, the health official only talking about cloth masks, only talking about social distancing hand wash. Where are we talking about nutrition? Community, getting out, being around each other. That's what keeps us healthy. Being out in the sun. None of this stuff is talked about by local health officials, federal health officials. It's ridiculous. We call ourselves, you call yourselves health officials and don't speak anything about health. It's bizarre. I ask the committee to throw this ordinance in the trash and allow the people of this county to continue on with their freedoms and making the decisions they deem best for themselves, their family, and their community. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Balke. My name is Linda Balke. I live at W4441 Willow Bend Road in Waldo. And I'm here to urge you to reject um, proposed Ordinance 3. When I first started researching this ordinance, I was told that it doesn't give the county health officer any power that they don't already have. Then why do we need this ordinance? Passing this ordinance would give an unelected official unlimited power to create their own laws and enforce them. It's like giving the police department the power to make their own laws and then enforce them. There's a lawmaking process in this land already in place, and this circumvents that process. There's already a law enforcement mechanism. And law enforcement officers take an oath to uphold the Constitution. The county health officer does not. We're told that the civil penalties that are being offered are less harsh than the criminal penalties. Well, that's because they can't enforce criminal penalties. And there's less protection in a civil suit than there is in a criminal case. In a criminal case, you have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be appointed to you. In a civil case, if you can't afford one, you're just out of luck. In a criminal case, you're innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's just a preponderance of evidence, meaning whether or not you're more likely to have done what they said, 51% certainty. In a criminal case, you have a right to a speedy trial, not so in a civil case. 
And there are other protections in a criminal case that we have that aren't there in a civil case. Um, the penalties of the state are limited. Um, the state statute's limited to a $500 fine or 30 days in jail or both. But in this ordinance, there are no limits. Everybody seems to focus on $25 for the first offense, 50 for the second, 100 for the third, and seem to forget that there are other penalties that can be inflicted. There's four penalties listed. Number three says um, the entry of judgment for a forfeiture. Forfeiture means you give them money. How much money? Doesn't say. Totally unlimited. Very vague. Also, there's no time limit. It, on, it says orders to the public at large. Um, says an order can be issued for not more than 60 days, which can be extended by subsequent orders. So basically, it's unlimited. It can go on and on. Adam Payne's quoted as saying there's nothing in the ordinance that talks about vaccines. There's nothing in the ordinance that prohibits mandatory vaccines. Again, it's very vague and allows anything. This proposed ordinance gives one elected official the power to act autonomously and immediately. We're told there's county board oversight, but the wording is any order to the public at large shall be submitted to the health, to health and human services and executive committees upon issuance for review at a joint meeting. And basically, that's after the fact. I mean, basically, they're finding out when the public's finding out when it's issued. So they're not saying, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think? They're saying, this is what we did. And if Adam Payne thinks that some of the state statutes are frightening, I can't understand how he can champion this ordinance. Thank you for letting me express my views. Thank you. Sue Kaiser is next. Good evening. My name is Sue Kaiser, and I live at 1024 Sunset Drive in Plymouth, Wisconsin. I want to take you down a little trip down memory lane. I want you to go back, and I'm talking to the supervisors, I want you to go back to a time in your life when you decided that it was time for you to serve your community as a county board supervisor. For some of you, that time is a relatively short period of time to have to think back to. But for others of you, that time frame is spanning many decades. So it might be a little tougher to bring yourself back to that moment in time. But I ask you to try. I ask you to try to remember the time in your life when you decided that you cared more about your community than you cared about your own personal time. Try to remember that time in your life when you decided there was a certain set of tools that you could bring to this table that could make a difference. In both email conversations and telephone chats that I've had with some of you, time and again I heard the words care and heart come up frequently. I applaud you and I deeply thank you for your years of service to our community. I'm pretty sure that this particular day was not on your radar when you made your decision to become a county supervisor. Oh, sure, you knew you wouldn't always win the popularity contest, but I bet you didn't see this one coming. Kind of like serving in the military, ready to do that service, but sure hope a war never makes you have to go in and serve that way. But then there were masks. Such a small, tiny little object to raise so much hoopla. Reminds me of being a parent or a mentor or a volunteer with youth. Our children can sometimes be errant children. They can play nice with others until all of a sudden another little girl grabs your son's truck and he hauls off and hits her with it because it's his toy. Or when it's recess and best friends run out to the swing set and your daughter doesn't get there first, so she pushes her best friend off the swing because she wanted it. 
errant children, moldy constituents, not too much different. So, what exactly am I trying to say here? I guess I'm trying to say, vote tonight like a parent. Vote knowing that you aren't supposed to be your child's friend. You're supposed to be their parent. You're supposed to keep your children safe. As you all know, our county COVID numbers keep rising as well as our deaths. But also as a parent, it is your responsibility to make sure your children do not harm others. Therefore, making sure public health guidelines are upheld. I'd really like you to remember back to when you decided to run for this position. Remember that through it all, words like care and heart were the words you all seem to keep using for our county. So show that caring heart when you vote for Ordinance 3. Adam Payne, Starling Grossman, you rock. Last week I was thinking of calling and canceling my time to speak tonight, knowing I was going to be the only one talking during this public comment time about the positive sides of a mask mandate and having our county adhere to CDC guidelines was a daunting obstacle in front of me. Tonight, my legs are quivering, my knees are knocking, my stomach is as tight as a knot, my palms are sweating, and my heart is racing. Not because I'm nervous with excitement, but rather because I'm afraid. Yep, afraid. I'm afraid of the lack of caring for others and common sense that I see in my community. I'm afraid to walk through the angry mob of protesters outside. I'm afraid to say I support the mask mandate and I support following CDC guidelines. I'm afraid to say I think public health should have the right to say we mask up and lock down if necessary. But then I thought of Adam, I thought of Starlene, and I knew that I could take it because of no matter how much backlash I get for speaking tonight, you two have been taking a ton more heat and for a lot longer. So if no one else tells you two or all of you supervisors tonight, I'm gonna be shouting it from the roof. Thank you, all of you, for your service to Sheboygan County. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. John Wright. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. Uh, I'm Dr. John Wright. I'm a lifetime, re lifetime resident of Sheboygan County, live on 228 2nd Street in Falls. I also own the Southwest State Bank building on South 12th Street as a way to revitalize this community. And that's where my office is, Better Life Chiropractic and Wellness. So I've invested a lot of time, love, money, and everything into this community in terms of volunteering and everything else. I'm here to speak as a concerned citizen, but also someone who's been in the healthcare world for 17 years in this community. Hope they can bring some light to some different scenarios. And I appreciate all of the speakers tonight, regardless of opinions, but that's why we're here. This is what we want to do and communicate with the government. Let me open by saying I'm not against county preparedness, as we need actual emergency actions in place. I'm not opposed to county board oversight on public health. That being said, the ordinance is very vague, as others have mentioned, to explain all measures that are, quote, reasonable and necessary. I don't think any of you would sign a mortgage with those words in there at all saying reasonable and necessary things down the road. These are all things we want to really look at and look at details and I think the details are really important with everything that we do. So why am I here, right? I've been in contact with numerous healthcare providers and other people in this area as well as different parts of the state and all of them have said to me, I'm not going to speak up because I'm afraid of my job. And that's the thing that makes me very scared, and they're afraid of reprimands from their employers, whether it's big hospitals or small clinics. In no way, shape, or form do I feel that that's safe that doctors, nurses, and other healthcare staff members are afraid to have their own opinions and their expertise, whether it's however many years of service they've done in the healthcare world, to give their opinions to their patients. Obviously, I'll say it's a lot easier to go about your daily tasks and stay under the radar by following quote unquote standards of care in the healthcare world. But that's not okay. You know, Sheboygan County demands and deserves better. And doctor means teacher, and I want to hopefully truly educate some people about health. Um, 
we aren't doing our jobs if we're not teaching people about health. So what am I standing up for? You know, at the end of the day, we want to have people to be educated of what's going on and make sure we learn from previous mistakes, right? Obviously, I'm not going to go over other things people have mentioned, but what happens if people didn't stand up for Vioxx, right? It's an extreme case, but bear with me. It appears that it's caused 140,000 heart attacks and 60,000 deaths. At some point, though, that had to effectively pass all the FDA regulations that are there. We're not going to go into all the other details, but from thalidomide and all the different things that are there. And what happens in our healthcare world or government, whatever, we have a really significant lack of trust that occurs. And that's been seen a lot with healthcare, government, and if this ordinance somehow gets through, that would kind of add to the distrust. And that trust is up to the members in this room this evening. And how much do you want that trust of the community? So going over statistics, right? So we could go from the CDC. It says nationally, if this is from, quote, uh, influenza-like illness activity remains below baseline for the 21st consecutive week and is at levels that are typical for this time of year, quoted. Based on death certificate data, the percentage of deaths attributed to pneumonia, influenza, or COVID for the week of the 36th is 6.3%, which is above the epidemic uh, range, but we have to look at this from the big picture. We're looking at COVID, influenza, and pneumonia all together. Cumulative uh, hospitalization rates since March 1, 0.16% overall, 0.45% if you're over 65. In Sheboygan, according to the, re the studies, or the numbers I saw the other day, 0.78% infection rate. So what is the end game? Is it no cases? In which case we have to get rid of testing. I'm not saying we should do that. So what is the effectiveness of flu treatment that we have? And what have we done for the past couple decades to make sure that we're protecting our people? Honestly, it comes down to what's the baseline health of the individual? And I have no... I'm not saying anything negative to people. That's just the statistics of how it is. The CD says, CDC says the average BMI is about 30 for every single adult in the United States, which puts us all in OB, obese category. Again, I'm not picking on anybody at all. These are the statistics. We look at infant mortality rate being very high in the, in the, in the, um, the US. So let's be honest, right? If the virus was the only factor in play, again, I'm not trying to be insensitive. If the virus was the only factor in play, if you had the virus, it would be 100% death rate. There are other factors in place. So we look at all these things, it comes down to, we're not gonna tell people you can't buy soda, you can't do Twinkies, you can't buy cigarettes. But what we've done overall is not create a community of health. And I don't have any negatives toward public health and everything else, but let's make some maybe big changes to get this under control. Because it's a virus, it's gonna be around. So what do we do to, to make sure that we're protecting our people, young and old. Interestingly, I went on PubMed last night, which is where you get all the research. I typed in vitamin D and immunity. There were 5,237 articles that showed up. I typed in exercise and immunity. There are 2,771. When's the last time we heard anybody on TV talk about exercise or vitamin D, let alone sleep, better stress management, and everything else? And what I've seen in the last many months in practice, after 17 years, I've never seen my patients more stressed in my life. And that scares me. What more scares me is that when the flu comes, and the flu is going to come, no matter who the person is, it is here, it's a virus. It's going to be more prone to people that have been under stress for the last six months. So we look at hospitals, yes, we want to keep them under control so they can protect people if they have really significant issues. But this leads to the baseline health of the individual, and that's where it comes down to the person in the mirror and making sure we're doing things to protect our own health, which will also help our community. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Joe Sheehan. Good evening. I am Joe Sheehan, Executive Director of Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Long word, what does that mean? Before I go into some of their answers and their comments for you, a couple of things you need to hear. Sheboygan County Economic Development supports you. The discussions that we had as a whole group, and you know who they are, there are business, education, government leaders saying Sheboygan is an incredible place to live. It's going to continue to grow and develop. As we had our discussions with them, they said, and you really need to hear this, we support you. They took a motion unanimously, and I will read that to you very clearly because there's been some 
confusion of what the SDDC support. But hopefully I can look at every one of you. They support your actions. They support what you've done. And they have incredible faith, and some may call it blind faith. Absolutely not. It's earned faith, and that is huge. There's an earned trust here in our county of you. And those of you that have gone around other parts of the country, don't take that for granted. We surely can't. Good leadership also takes patience. You've got people with different views. Thank you for listening to them, and I know you continue to do that. That's an important part of an incredibly healthy community. So if there's ever, you know, I used to be an educator. There's one thing you get out of this tonight from me, from the SCDC, is thank you, we trust you, and we're going to work forward together to make sure Sheboy continues to grow and prosper. The actual statement, the SCDC, again, mouthful, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Before I read the, the motion, just need you know, and Dietra, what you said is accurate. Talking to our business leaders, they constantly came back to, we got to take care of our employees. By the way, our employees are also parents. By the way, employers are also parents. So the motion talks about business, also talks about education. But the strength of that, we just talked, and that's how they felt. It wasn't, oh, can you really think about? They, they walked in with the discussions with that in mind. How do we take care of our employees? First things first. So long term, they're going to be safe, and they're going to be able to stay here and operate. The SCDC supports local, state, and federal public health guidelines to reduce and eliminate the spread of COVID-19, including requiring masks, maintaining social distance, and limiting mass gatherings. In addition, if the data and health officials indicate that additional measures are necessary, the SCDC supports Sheboygan County officials in taking further measures to suppress the spread of the disease with the end goal of keeping our schools and businesses open and our economy going. Some of you may read that and say, that's a blank, that's just a blank check. No, it's not. It's a, a earned trust thought. And I know with you and your leadership, you're going to have people at the table to talk about these things, to make sure they understand. So again, appreciate all these people with their passion that are here tonight. They're part of Sheboygan County. And part of the strength of Sheboygan County is having an open government. That's what we believe in, and that's what we're about in Sheboygan. So on behalf of all of Sheboygan County, and very specifically, you need to hear the SCDC, the trust, the earned trust that all of you have done. So go to bed tonight, get up in the mirror, look in the mirror and go, you know what? They heard. They actually trust me. Why? Because you want Sheboygan to be the best it can be. So again, thank you. That is all of our speakers. All right. Next is letter communications and announcements. Uh, the only thing I have is a resolution from Price County regarding supporting the commitment to Veterans Supportive Outreach Act. Since we've had that before, we'll receive that for information. That is all. Next is the county administrator's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. I hope everyone's hanging in there. This is a, a longer and heavy board meeting and a very important one, and we certainly appreciate all of the input that we've received associated with COVID and our emergency planning. Um, you know, my, my sincere thanks and appreciation to everyone who's been working together to slow the spread of COVID-19. Critically important for our community, and we've seen what's happened in other communities across the state, the nation, the world. It's so critical that we keep our businesses open, our schools open, our places of worship open. And we have been working as effectively as we can in collaboration with others to keep our community safe. So we appreciate the feedback and everyone taking personal responsibility to be part of the solution. Our public health professionals, our direct care providers, our emergency responders, our schools and universities, the LTC, the clergy, county chamber, Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, and thousands and thousands of residents in Sheboygan County 
have stepped up to be part of the solution. It is making a difference. It's making a difference. And now is not the time to let our guard down. I think for many of us, it feels like we've been grappling with this for a long time. Yet it was just on March 13th that President Trump declared a national state of emergency. I am so proud of our public health officer and our public health staff and the outstanding job they have done to work with others, to work in collaboration to protect our community, to protect residents. I, I'm, I'm so proud of them. They need our support. They've earned our support. And they are very capable and qualified and passionate people. We owe them a debt of gratitude for what they've been doing and how they've been serving this community. On August 14th, the Health and Human Services Committee proposed an ordinance. They didn't do it in the dark of the night. They did it because we're in the midst of a battle with COVID-19 and we wanted to get our emergency plans up in front and center. And unlike what was reported, the county board wasn't voting on it the next day. It went through the normal two month process for input and we've received a lot of input. And we appreciate the thoughtful and respectful input that we've received. In fact, when the executive committee got together to discuss this proposal, they made a number of changes. And some of the speakers this evening were referring to the first draft when there were further improvements made. I readily admit the first draft could be improved upon. I've yet to meet the perfect person, and I've yet to meet the perfect ordinance or law. There's always room for improvement, and without question, it, it could be more clear. And so some refinements were made to that. But I want to be really clear again on what our objectives were. We were striving to be transparent about our COVID-19 emergency planning. If the ordinance was passed tonight, nothing changes. It isn't a mask mandate. It isn't an immediate public health order. We were striving to be transparent about our emergency planning. For example, if things got significantly worse, and I'll use the word again, I hope it doesn't. We all hope it doesn't, don't we? But if things get significantly worse and our hospitals are on the brink of being overrun with COVID patients, what might trigger a countywide public health order? We have, we have not had any countywide public health orders. Not one to date, because of the good work of our staff and everyone involved is working in collaboration to defeat COVID-19. But if our hospitals were on the brink of being overrun with COVID patients, what may trigger a countywide public health order? What would be the process? What would be the enforcement measures? Aren't these things that the community would expect us to share and be transparent about? Isn't that one of the objectives of emergency planning. This is what we'll do if certain situations occur. So to this end, we work very closely with our hospitals. And you heard our public health officer say, we, we speak with our hospital uh, representatives daily. In this instance, we spoke with the president of both our area hospitals and we asked them, what would be that trigger? When would you be concerned? What would be a key indicator that our hospitals are becoming overwhelmed. We didn't know. We asked them. And that's where they shared if 50% of our ICU beds or medical surgical beds have COVID positive patients in them, we need to be concerned as a community. And we don't want to act after they're overwhelmed, right? We want to take some action before they're overwhelmed. So they said that was the trigger. We said, okay, and we built that into the ordinance. The proposed ordinance also, and this is the irony of all the feedback that so many of us have received, and thank you for that feedback. This is Sheboygan County, and we do listen 
to one another and we make changes and we make improvements. I'll bet you 50% of the people that emailed me or called and said, we don't want all that authority in the hands of one unelected official, one public health officer, all that authority. He or she is going to make that decision on their own? You've got to be kidding me. Really? At least 50% of the people said that to me. And I said, did you read the ordinance? It builds in legislative oversight, checks and balances. And the first draft had it with the Health and Human Services Committee and the Executive Committee, two standing committees. After further input from the community, we changed that to the full county board. That's what's in the most recent draft. So we appreciate that feedback. But if you've read the ordinance, it doesn't put all the power in the hands of one individual. It decentralizes it to the full county board. There's checks and balances, which, by the way, isn't required under current state law. That's currently not a requirement. We built that in. And then finally, the proposed ordinance addresses enforcement provisions. Well, what's it going to look like if the hospitals are overrun, if our public health officer has to make an order of some kind, if the county board approves that? What kind of enforcement mechanisms would we have to hold it up? Under current state law, it talks about jail and $500 fines, and it involves law enforcement and our district attorney. Our law enforcement officials are stretched so thin today they're doing such incredible work. Our district attorney very stretched very thin. We didn't want to burden them further. So we put that enforcement authority in the public health staff, and we reduced it from jail and a $500 fine to the what was mentioned earlier, I think $25, $50, and $100. We took the current state law, and we're not changing it. That law exists today. It will continue to exist but we reduced the types of fines or penalties that would be in it if we had to take greater action to protect our community. Former Secretary of State and General Colin Powell said, never believe the first thing you hear. Sadly, there was an initial news report, I think within two or three days of the proposed ordinance, and it got it all wrong. It got it all wrong. And in fact, it said the county board was going to be voting the next night on the ordinance. You know what? As a resident of this community, I'd be ticked off too. What? What's all in this? They're acting tomorrow night? I can appreciate why it got people upset, frustrated. I get it. But that was all wrong. But then it got out on Facebook, and here we are. Here we are. I can tell you with 100% sincerity that the people that were involved with developing this proposed ordinance care a great deal about this community, want to do the right thing, and I'd like to think that history is a pretty good indicator of the future. Look at the track record of this county board, the thoughtfulness of this county board, the professionalism of our staff. Collaboration has been key to our success for decades. Yet, during these very difficult times, that the doctor said he's never seen his patient so stressed out, whoo! Huh. I see it in my spouse, I see it in my children, I see it in my parents, I see it in my coworkers, I see it in county board's faces. I see it in the people who are here tonight and the people who are outside. The current level of angst and frustration and uncertainty, it's as high as I've ever seen. And during these difficult times, this ordinance, this proposed ordinance with the best of intentions, it's clearly serving as a lightning rod and it's contributing to more angst and uncertainty. We hear you. We heard you. All of us should be striving to keep our community safe. Every single one of us should be striving to keep our community safe. 
we should be striving to support and lift one another up. Not tear one another down. And we should treat one another like our parents taught us. Treat people like you want to be treated. Through all this angst and uncertainty, I've, I've never seen this level of rancor. and uh, It's just remarkable. All of us should be coming together with the common goal of defeating COVID. I mean, that should be our common goal, right? Our collective health, keeping our businesses, schools, places of worship open depends on all of us taking personal responsibility. People say they want, don't do anything, don't tell us what to do, allow us to take personal responsibility. Then take it. Right? Take it. Lead by example. Look in the mirror down the road when this is all past us and say, what did I do to be part of the solution? Who did I lift up? Whose lives did I change for the better? Tonight, I hope the county board will follow the lead of the county executive committee and move to file the proposed ordinance. I want to thank all who have provided us, provided us with thoughtful and respectful input. And again, everyone for taking some personal responsibility to keep our community safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next is consideration of committee reports. Executive Committee Re Resolution Number 11. Regarding the 2021 five-year capital plan recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for approval of resolution number 11. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Now under discussion. Seeing no light, let's vote on resolution number 11. Unanimously. Resolution number 12. Regarding approving permanent easement for Village of Kohler Sewer Interceptor at Erie Avenue, Old Plank Road Trail, Trailhead. Recommendation to adopt. Supervisor Gehring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will move for adoption. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Wagner. I'll second that. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Now under discussion. Okay, seeing no discussion, please vote. That motion is also approved unanimously. Ordinance number three. Regarding creating section 10.09 disease control, providing for enforcement of public health orders and legislative oversight, committee recommendation amend by replacing original version with revised version and file with the clerk. Supervisor Obler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to move to file the ordinance at number three as amended. Thank you, Supervisor Obler. Supervisor Wagner. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Under discussion? S Supervisor Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe it's my duty as chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee of this county board to speak. I'm going to be a bit repetitive. Adam said a lot of what I was going to say. The question is why? Why are we scrapping this ordinance? It was well crafted. It took away no one's rights. We spent a lot of time on this, a lot of thought. It was written only to be used in a real COVID emergency. It was written with the guidance of the Wisconsin Counties Association. It was vetted by our county's legal counsel. Its penalty section was for civil sanctions rather than criminal. This usually means no jail time. Before it would have gone into effect, two committees and the county board would have to approve it. 
Remember, these are people that you, the citizens, elected. We remember that you elected us. That's one of the reasons why I'm going to vote to scrap this thing. Anyway, I'm also going to vote to scrap this thing just to put it behind us. Okay? But let's remember. Let's just remember. This morning, it was reported two more people died of COVID. We now have it in the high schools where I'm teaching one hour a day. North has a case, South has a case. If it really goes out of hand, we're going to be back to complete virtual learning. And then the parents will have to probably stay home with their kids because they can't find people to care for them. This is a serious disease. It won't go away on its own. Now we only have three weapons to fight it. Face covering, quarantine and social distancing, and good hygiene. By the way, I find it reprehensible that people are going to attack Adam Payne. His intentions were good. I know, I sat in on the discussions. Threats are out of line to this county board, to your fellow citizens, to each other, to anybody. You don't accomplish a whole lot by threats. Oh, you may get sometimes a thing or two changed, but in the end, it doesn't work. Don't make your cause personal. Don't attack Starlene Grossman. She's doing a great job. I know, I've sat in on hour after hour with my committee and meetings with her. I'm really kind of upset with those people who attacked Adam and Starr and some of the other county board members. Really kind of upset. I've been on this board for almost 20 years. I was a city alderman for six years. I've taught high school in this community for 52 years. 40 of it full time. Public service is what I'm about. There is no way in hell I was trying to take away anyone's rights or hurt anybody. My objective was to help people, and I know that was the objective of this county board. So those people, okay, we're putting the ordinance on the shelf. But I would warn you that if COVID goes wild, we'll see this ordinance back probably, and we'll probably see it even more restrictive. I hope that God helps us. I hope that COVID does go away. But just remember, be nice to one another. Don't criticize. We're all in the same boat together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Supervisor Nelson? Uh, And pursuant to the county board rules, this is a debatable motion. Supervisor Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know we have a large audience uh, watching on TV, if not today, in the future. Uh, so if it, if it would please you, I would uh, just like to have you explain exactly uh, what a yes and what a no vote will mean. Thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Corporation Council, would you mind? Yes. And so I'm, and I'm paraphrasing the motion, but the motion was made to file as amended. And under the county board rules, a motion to file with the county clerk is in essence a motion to kill the ordinance, which means it would not be enacted. So if you are in favor of killing the ordinance, then you would vote yes or aye tonight. And, and if you would prefer that the, the motion or that the ordinance continue to move forward, then you would be a no vote. Supervisor Nenning? Um, I have the same question that Henry did and you've just answered it. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, see no other lights. We will then vote on ordinance number three. approved unanimously next is consideration of committee reports finance committee resolution number 13 regarding authorizing county aid for culvert construction in the towns of Holland Lima and Sheboygan recommendation to adopt 
Supervisor Gary. Mr. Chairman, I move for adoption of resolution number 13. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Supervisor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Under discussion? Seeing no lights, please vote. Motion's also approved unanimously. And I turn the gavel over to the vice chair. Good evening to you all. Resolutions introduced. Resolution number 14. From Executive Committee regarding reaffirming membership in Wisconsin Bay Workforce Development Area Consortium and approval of amended consortium agreement. Resolution number 14 will be referred to Human Resources. Resolution number 15. From the Finance Committee regarding authorizing the issuance and sale of $4,166,000 taxable general obligation refunding bonds. Resolution number 15 will be referred to Executive Committee. There are no ordinances introduced. Uh, Mr. Destrudy, would you help me with, Supervisor Destrudy, would you help me with the next order of business? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll move to adjourn. Thank you, Supervisor Destruity. Is there a second? Supervisor Immel. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I make a vote. I'll, I'll second that. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Let's all vote, please. Thank you.